and welcome to the Financial Fox. Today we will be talking about medicinal cannabis. I have a panel of three experts who can provide a great insight, knowledge and expertise on the subject. Our first guest is Frank D'Ambrosio, American surgeon with over 30 years experience who has studied and witnesses the positive effect of medicinal cannabis. He has been campaigning for cannabis globally, advising government bodies and pushing for policy reform. Our second guest is Peter Reynolds, president of the largest private cannabis policy group in the UK, Clear Cannabis Law Reform, and also author of an international paper analyzing the evidence of medicinal cannabis benefits. Last but not least is Chris Snowden, the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, who is also author of a number of publications of lifestyle, addiction and society. Welcome to my guest. Frank, I would like to start with you. Uh, maybe if you could uh, give us a little bit um, of information about your background, the work you have been doing for the last uh, 30 years, and uh, some insight on uh, uh, the medicinal cannabis. Okay. Um, I'm, an ortho I'm a board-certified orthopedic surgeon as well as a board-certified spinal surgeon. And uh, approximately uh, 25, 30 years ago, I started a practice uh, to do spine surgery and trying to get surgery uh, for a variety of reasons in the spine, from the brain all the way down to the tailbone. And after 25 years of practice, what I realized was that uh, it didn't work. Spine surgery doesn't work. People who try to get spine surgery in order to alleviate back pain don't get their back pain alleviated. And after 25 years of practice, I had an office full of people who not only had residual back pain, but also were addicted to opioids. And it was just becoming an intolerable situation. So what I had to do was rethink the pain management of my patients. And I, and I, I did it by using cannabis. Now, luckily, I was in a state, California, that allowed physicians to use cannabis in a way that it was treated as a medicine. Uh, 1996 in California, they passed the Compassionate Use Act, which allowed patients to get access to cannabis. Specifically, it grew out of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco, and all of these poor people who were suffering from uh, the GI distress, from the chemotherapy, all of the, the immunosuppressive uh, disorder that it is, they started being able to use cannabis for this, and it eventually became a pain relief for the patients as well. Well, if it's existing already, I, what I wanted to do was try to use it for my back pain patients, and I was able to, I would say 99% of my patients, close to five or 6,000 patients over the next four or five years who were addicted to opioids, where I was able to switch them completely over into the use of cannabis. And from the use of opioids and, the, and that, that addiction process, I started using cannabis for alcohol, for heroin, for meth, even just to get off of methadone. And from there, it just sort of snowballed. My practice just exploded because there were so many different diseases that responded to cannabis. All of the GI diseases, everything as far as muscles concerned, neurological diseases, Everybody was responding to cannabis. They were decreasing their use of prescription medicine, which has well-known side effects. And every single medicine that is out there from the pharmaceutical companies has what we call lethal dose 50. That amount that you can take, above which 50% of your time you will die. No one has ever died from the use of cannabis. It, has, it doesn't exist. The theoretical lethal dose 50 of cannabis, you would have to actually smoke 30 pounds of cannabis in 15 minutes. It doesn't happen. So the evolution of my philosophy with regards to cannabis came from, from years of seeing surgery not work, the opioid epidemic gripped the United States, and the use of cannabis as a result of 
the treatment of patients afflicted with AIDS in San Francisco in the 90s. Chris, um, you, you, you are an author of a number of publications on lifestyle, addiction, and society. What do you think about uh, uh, Frank's comment on uh, um, the, the benefit and the, the, the effect of medicinal cannabis? Well, I think the, the evidence is impressive. Uh, it's good enough for me. Uh, we have legalized medicinal cannabis in the UK. We did it last year. The problem is that nobody can get hold of it. And the reason no one can get hold of it was twofold. One, doctors are loath to prescribe it. And two, our regulators feel that there isn't enough evidence um, that it works on a cost effectiveness basis. So you've got two issues really, which is um, from, from the regulator's point of view. One is that they don't feel there are enough studies for a lot of conditions. And the other is that it's, they feel it's not cost effective. So one solution is to get the cost down. Uh, the other solution is to get more scientific evidence. And I'm a big believer in uh, medical cannabis. And indeed, I want to uh, legalize recreational cannabis too. I, I, I've seen plenty of people who um, had the kind of experience that you've just heard described. And it's certainly a hell of a lot better than getting hooks on opiates. But I do feel, uh, as an empiricist, that, that I understand the regulator's desire for more strong scientific evidence and randomized controls trials. Uh, Peter, uh, do you want to jump in and maybe uh, give your views on uh, what kind of policies needed in order to uh, get medicinal cannabis actually implemented in, in the UK? Because we are kind of stuck. Yes, well, well to, to, to add to what Christopher has said, I think there's one other very, very important factor which impacts directly on the price, but also on just the willingness to prescribe it, and that is domestic production of medicinal cannabis. Um, you know, we, the, the problem is we have a home office, um, we have every regulator, and by regulator I mean the MHRA, the Food Standards Agency, and the Royal Colleges, where all, all, these, all these bodies, all these institutions are institutionally opposed to cannabis. Uh, the Home Office has been engaged for at least 50 years in a systematic deception and, uh, of the British people, systematically misleading them on the evidence and scaremongering based, based on no scientific basis at all. Um, so so I, th I think until the Home Office frees up and starts issuing licenses, for domestic production, the problem is going, to, is going to continue as it is. I think, I think that is at least as much of an issue uh, as the issue of evidence. And, and as far as evidence is concerned, I think I've, I've just today, in fact, concluded responding to NICE's dra draft guidelines on medicinal cannabis. And, and what, what, what is overwhelming in, in the draft guidelines is how much disproportionate weight they give to the potential harm for cannabis. Now, we know there are approximately 250 million worldwide regular users of cannabis. And when you look at the, the, the degree of harm that is caused, or the number of adverse events there are based on that population, then there, 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 there are fewer adverse events and fewer problems than for common over-the-counter medicines. And it really seems to me that it is the case. We can't treat cannabis in the same way as we treat other potentially dangerous experimental medicines. We've been using it for thousands of years. And what we should be prepared to do is, is, is prescribe it to patients on the basis of try it and see. There's, there's virtually no evidence of any significant harm, and there is no evidence at all of significant harm where it's given under the supervision of a medical professional. Um, yeah. and, 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 and until we, we, we make that breakthrough, then I, then I think it's going to continue to be very difficult. You mentioned something very interesting about trials. I mean, um, I think it's only in Israel where you can do human trials with, uh, with cannabis, isn't it? So maybe it's that kind of lack of uh, um, cases and then you have to go back to, uh, you know, the live cases that people, they actually decided to take it but with private clinics and they can tell their story, but actually there isn't, uh, you know, some, some trials, some cases that have been studied, they have been, they are done like any other, any other drugs, basically. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's a complete f failure to accept any, obs what, you know, what we, what we call observational trials uh, or what you could more simply call real world experience. I mean, even in the case of, you know, some of these children with, with drug resistant epilepsy, we can see that some of them have been using cannabis you know, with very low levels of THC for a, for a considerable period of time, and it stopped or massively reduced their seizures. And yet there's a complete absence of common sense because that, that, that evidence in front of your eyes simply isn't being accepted by the medical establishment. And what, what do you think is the solution here? I mean, I, I first gave evidence to Parliament on the subject of medical cannabis in 1983. Um, so I've seen politicians come and go uh, and in a sense, the attitude of politicians has changed very little. And I think although, you know, it's a very welcome uh, reform took place last year, uh, I'm increasingly of the opinion that, that there is such resistance from vested interests and from the medical establishment that the only way we will really get cannabis to those people who need it is by general legalization. I, I, I think that the, the medical use of cannabis will come but it will, but it's going to take time. It's going to take a long time to work through the, 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 the medical establishment. I think, I think certainly from our point of view, we're more interested now in campaigning for general legalization. That's the only way forward. Frank, do you really want to give your, your, your views on what is happening in the US that is probably not the same that is over here? I mean, I, I, I'd be happy to talk what's going on in the U.S., but if I could just address something Peter just said. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things that we're missing here, and that is that if you are going to base all of your plans for what you're going to allow your patients to use as far as medicine is concerned, and you are going to have to do all of your testing within your country and completely ignore what's been done in other yeah. countries, it's going to take years. You're absolutely right. Why not accept uh, research that's been done in other countries? Stuff that's been done in the United States, stuff that's been done in Israel, that's been done in the, in the East. There are studies that have been done. Why not just at least accept some of these studies, number one? Number two, what is the problem with cannabis? I mean, there are, cannabis is this beautiful little plant that has maybe five constituents that we really want to talk about. It's got water, it's got flavonoids, it's got terpenes, CBD, and THC. Flavonoids you can find in nature, water you can find in nature. Terpenes are in the rinds of every citrus fruit. CBD in the United States at this point is going to be a neutral additive. It's going to be essentially a dietary supplement. So really, all we're really, really, I think, concerned about is the THC. And if you're concerned that the THC can't be tested, well, then just go to Marinol. Marinol is lab-created THC. It's available on the NHS. It has already gone through testing. So if why are you not using the testing from the Marinol or the, dro, dro, I think it's called Drobanol? Dro, 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 no, right. Why aren't you using that testing? to extrapolate because the establishment simply wants to stop it uh, i mean i mean you, know, you, you say you say you say thc is the problem and i mean i agree with you in a sense that's what that's the only realistic argument but in fact they've now, in, in in the uk in the eu they've now decided that cbd is a problem because the eu has come in with these this ridiculous novel foods designation where it's, where it's decided out of the blue, on the basis of no evidence at all, that cannabis extracts have not been consumed at all in the European Union prior to 1997. So they're now creating a problem around CBD and putting people who want to produce CBD in a position where without investing two to three hundred thousand pounds or euros in, in a novel foods authorization process, they won't be able to sell, even as a food supplement, this entirely benign substance that even the World Health Organization has described as benign. A or is that all of Europe? Is, it, is, yes. this, is it just in the UK or is no, it throughout, throughout the whole of Europe? Throughout the whole of Europe. So all of, you, of, of, of the Euro nations right now are now trying to say that CBD is also a problem. Exactly. Why? 
Yeah. Well, that. throw your hands up in the air. That's what I feel like. <laughs> so THC and, and CBD, they are two components and they are treating different kinds of uh, diseases, let's say. So, I mean, also the THC could be quite beneficial for some patients, isn't it, Frank? Well, yes. I know that there are some people who argue that CBD is able to treat seizures and everything like that, but the majority of the research I've read is that THC is the only one of the cannabinoids that's fat soluble, so it's able to actually cross the blood brain barrier and be able to affect the brain. If you're worried about Parkinson's disease and seizures disorders or anything like that, if you don't have a small THC, I don't know how you're going to treat that particular issue. CBD, although someone tried to explain to me, well, we've seen research where it can't pass in. The majority of the research I've seen is that if you don't have THC, you're not getting it in to treat a central nervous system problem. Well, CBD seems to work in the short term for people, but it's, its beneficial effects wear off very quickly. So, I mean, I, maybe that's because only a small amount of the CBD can actually cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah. The mechanism is just so convoluted that it can't get in there. But you need THC flows freely into the brain. If you're trying to, to fix or to treat a central nervous system issue, you need the THC. Everybody's so afraid of the THC. You're afraid. When I was on uh, Good Morning Britain last year, this woman was sitting there next to me telling me, well, we don't want our, our children to be addicted or to have to the long-term problems with THC. You're talking about a, a, a six-month-old baby who's seizing 300 times a day. If they live three years old, it'll be a miracle. You're worried about what's going to happen when they're in their 20s or 30s? It's, it's ludicrous. It's insane. It is. Uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we're in a unique, unique position in the UK because we have this complete hysteria about THC and about the, you know, the link with psychosis, uh, which is, which is, it is unique to the UK. There's nowhere else in the world apart from a couple of scientists in Australia who take the same view of it at all. You know, and if you look at the actual data, the actual healthcare records of how many people are, uh, are, have, have psychosis, which may be associated with cannabis, it's tiny. Well, it's not only tiny, but it, it reflects the general population as well. The numbers don't exactly. change the general population. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually just creating this hysteria. And I, I know that one of the things that I'm seeing in the United States is that as we age out the older generations, the younger generations, they don't see cannabis as this evil entity. They don't see it as something that they need to try. In the states that have gone legal, or at least with medical or recreational, the, the teenage, the pre-18 years when people are they, they're so afraid of having people use cannabis, it's down. The usage is down 15 yeah. to 20 People don't care. The yeah. kids don't care at this point. At 18, if they want to try something because their other medications aren't working, they try it then. This is not, I'm going to get high. I'm going to, I can't wait to be able to sneak out cannabis. You've created a, you've created a regulatory market where you can only get cannabis from a certain place. The yes. kids don't care. I think, I think this is a very good point because I think maybe what the government and uh, you know, Dr. Nack concern is also where the cannabis come from and all the supply chain because you know, um, it's kind of like, uh, it's not very much a regulated market. So maybe there is uh, lots of concern about the quality of the cannabis. So um, one of the things that um, is kind of picking up here in the UK, and there have been lots of companies discussing, is possibly to apply blockchain technology to track the, the provenance of the cannabis. Uh, I mean, the supply chain is one of the, you know, nowadays is one of uh, one of the obvious things. So maybe that could be a solution because I can understand that if you don't know the different elements, you are concerned particularly within the cannabis, that, you know, it can maybe create more problems. Yes, I, I think that's a great thing for, 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 for the future. I think that is necessary. But, I mean, we need to overcome some more fundamental issues than that in, in the UK, first of all, I think. I mean, well, I mean, a regulated market does a bunch of different things. Number one, we call it seed to sale. So that for, when you get into states where you have... Uh, recreational, legal, recreational, legal, medical, we now have to track from the, t the seed 
all the way through the growth, all the way to the sale. So you have the ability to track this. That's number one. Number two, you have to have a regulated market has strict quality control with regards to pesticides. You have to be able to, to test you know, all the constituents of the plant so you can adequately show the percentage of all the different components. But even greater than that, what you do by having a regulated market is you eliminate the black market. The black market has no regulations. The black market can use pesticides. It's more dangerous to have an unregulated market as far as the healthier citizen is concerned than to have a regulated market. It's the complete opposite of what we're what, what's, what's going on right now. I think also regarding this aspect, I think one of the problems, for example, in investment in, in the cannabis, cannabis company, in cannabis market, is about uh, um, you know, this, this, the money, where they come from. So the UK has, uh, um, is kind of considering lots of uh, anti-money laundering slow in order to make sure that you know, who is investing in cannabis are you know, proper money and uh, you know, they are not coming from uh, um, obscure sources, let's say. So I think this is one of the challenges of cannabis companies as well. I, I think you're right. I think that, again, again I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the United States, and I, do, I see things from 30,000 feet, especially when I'm flying into London. But the, the United Kingdom is the largest exporter of cannabis oil in the world. But the citizens <laughs> don't get a chance to use it. I'm not sure how you reconcile that. The, fir the, fir the first way you reconcile it is the Home Office doesn't even accept that that substance that being, is being exported is cannabis oil. It calls it nabiximols or Sativex, which it does not accept is whole plant cannabis oil. Oil. It's just the oil. You take yeah, it. I, I know that. I know that. They, um, the Home Office refuses to accept that Sativex is cannabis. This has been the case for, for many, many well, since 2010 when it was first licensed. It's not cannabis. Uh, I even mean, had the MHRA, the medicines regulator, put in writing to me Sativex is not cannabis. How can it not be cannabis? Well, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I'll just, I'll just tell you that as an insight into, into the way that the... Chris, what do you think will be, if we are looking at the benefits of uh, uh, medicinal cannabis for the UK, for example, um, and, you know, in case it's going to be widely adopted and actually patients can actually get it from the uh, NHS regularly, what will be really the benefit for the, for the countries? Well, obviously, the benefits to the people who are suffering from the various diseases that look like they can be alleviated or cured by uh, cannabis. And, you know, I have to say, I, I maybe agree with Peter to a certain extent about the, the various vested interests. We've had a war on drugs for 100 years. Cannabis has been illegal for a very long time. I don't know what the institutions and the people within them uh, think about legalizing even medical cannabis. But it has to be said, it is and has been for many years quite difficult to get a medicine regulated so it can be available on the NHS. It's partly the UK system. It requires a huge number of studies, in particular randomized control trials. The European Union has a precautionary principle. I hadn't heard about their clamp down on CBT, uh, CBD until tonight, but it's uh, interesting and telling that they they are doing that. California acts in a different way. I mean, California has different views on science in a lot of places. It, it thinks that glyphosate causes cancer. The European Union thinks it doesn't. San Francisco's just banned vaping. The UK is very pro-vaping. You know, so there is an element of politics to this, of course. But I feel that we're not going to um, get what I want out of this, which is for medical cannabis at least to be uh, not just legalized, but actually available to the children and adults who need it. Uh, but also eventually I hope uh, full legalization of recreational cannabis. We're not, we're not gonna get this by just complaining about it. I mean, we have to play by the rules of the game. I don't see any real reason to think that if the enormously wealthy um, cannabis industry that has emerged in recent years doesn't put some of its money 
into some good randomized control trials, which could be completed in a relatively short space of time. Uh, I'm talking within a year or two. Um, I don't see why we can't give organizations like NICE and the MHRA a big bank of studies for them to look at. And the ball is in, then in their court to say, well, we don't accept this evidence and give the reasons. And also yeah, I, I, on the cost effectiveness side of it, if we bring down the cost of these, these drugs, then the cost effectiveness argument is much less of, a, of an obstacle. Well, I, I think that's a very fair point. I mean, I do think there's been a great reluctance from cannabis companies. I mean, even Bedrocan, you know, who you might, who is the original European cannabis company, has always been very reluctant to put their products through clinical trials. Um, and I do think that's something that's got to change. But I mean, you know, it, there is a queue of very well qualified, very well funded, responsible organizations at the Home Office's door waiting to be given a license to produce cannabis, even if it's only for research purposes. And, and frankly, until the Home Office is prepared to face up to the reality of what the new policy is now and what the new, poli what the new regulations permit, and, and issue some licenses to these people, I can understand them saying, well, why should we? You know, I mean, give, let's, let's give Aurora. Let's, I, mean, I mean, I now consult for a number of large organizations on obtaining licenses. And I mean, I can go back before the new regulations. I won't mention names, but one of the biggest Canadian cannabis companies that is fully GMP compliant uh, um, uh, was refused access. You have to do a two-stage process in making a, li making a license application. First of all, you have to apply to get onto the online system. And they were refused access even to the online system to make an application. Um, and and, and that, that's the way the Home Office operates. It's institutionally opposed to cannabis. It's a, it has a hostile environment to cannabis, just as it has a hostile environment to immigration, and it seems everything else the British people want. Do you think that Boris is going to change anything? Maybe he could be the one. Well, there is what? talk about the fact he's got two advisors who are well known to be pro-cannabis. Uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, Boris has certainly indulged himself, um, and um, you know, maybe he could be the one. Yes, yeah. I, I think he could be. You know, I think he, he is a liberal at heart, and he could be radical at heart. You know, I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, if I, we... this, uh, I think I think Boris, uh, you couldn't ask for much of a better prime minister if you want somebody to take what is really quite a bold step. In, yeah. uh, in Europe, in, uh, in being the first country to get this rolling. I mean, Luxembourg, of course, is, uh, is going to get the ball rolling in the next year or so. My view has always been that um, it will happen sooner or later, full recreational legalization. But I never thought Britain would be at the front of the queue for that. Um, that remains my view. I think actually Boris and his cabinet are about as liberal as you're going to get and uh, probably about as bold as you're going to get. The question is, uh, is Boris even going to be in power for much longer? I mean, that's a, a, a big question here. Oh. At the moment. I think if he can cling on until next year, um, it's yeah. actually the kind of thing he probably would have a go at. Um, mm. the, the UK politicians have always been a bit worried about the tabloid press. That is much less of a fear now. Uh, I still think, however, that it will take two or three European countries to give it a go, show its success, more of the U.S. states falling as they continue to do without any real problems emerging and that all-important tax revenue rolling in for these countries and states. Yeah. And I think within five years or so, we'll be looking very seriously at it. But also, let's, uh, let's look at Canada. I mean, they, they, they made massive progress with cannabis. Frank, you are that part of the world. I mean, how they managed to do that? Well, they, they, they embraced it. The government embraced it. The government got behind it, and they, they allowed companies to flourish. They didn't, there was, there was no, there was no, like, time bombs waiting around the corners. They just, they got everybody involved, and they were able to create an industry. In the United States, even though there are 32 states at this point that have either uh, legal, medicinal, or recreational cannabis, the federal government still has it listed as a Schedule One drug, and theoretically, you could still get arrested for use of cannabis. As a so, 
so even though it, it seems like the United States is making all this amazing progress, and it is, and there, there is a significant steps with every state that comes on. We're now, we now have quorum. We now have 60% of the states who agree with this. The federal government, they're not budging. They are, they have, they've decided to keep it a Schedule One drug. They, you know, I don't know whether it's this administration that has emboldened them to try to make even CBD uh, because it's part of the cannabis plant, even that Schedule One. Luckily, that got shot down. Right now, in the United States, you can get CBD at gas stations. I mean, they sell little packets in the, in the gas stations. You can pour it in your water, shake it up, and you can go and, and have CBD water with all the benefits. Right now, at the same time, that the federal government still, still says that cannabis is a Schedule One drug with no medicinal benefits whatsoever. Zero, just like heroin and LSD, LSD rather. And just to prove how dysfunctional we still are, is that even though the DEA says that cannabis is a Schedule One drug with no medicinal benefits, the United States government owns a patent on cannabis as an antioxidant and neuroprotective. So on one, it's like the right hand is not talking to the left hand, and maybe it's because they don't want to, because this way they get the best of both. The uh, World Health Organization and the UN in general wants to move cannabis out of Schedule One, but it seems that the US is actually standing in the way of that. I know I spoke at the World Health Organization in Geneva last year at the uh, expert committee on uh, drug dependency and i made the case for cannabis and as a as an economy in, in developing countries as a way to get medicine to people who can't afford medicine and they agreed to to send it to the vote uh, at the un to try to take cannabis off the schedule one hasn't happened yet and it seems incredibly political at the expense of a lot of people's lives if, if we are looking at uh, the European uh, uh, cannabis market, um, I would like just uh, to share some views and see, you know, your, uh, uh, your input as well. Uh, I mean, it is uh, supposed to be a, a very big market for cannabis. Uh, maybe, maybe, Peter, do you want to expand a little bit? Because, I mean, it would be really important to, to share some lights on that and, uh, you know, and actually make people aware of uh, what it could actually be this, this European uh, cannabis market. Well, I mean, I think we can see the potential sides of it just by what we've seen happen with, with the CBD market. You know, the CB, I mean, there are various figures thrown around about the CBD market. Um, but, but I mean, it's gone from zero to hundreds of millions in the space of five years, le le less than that, really. Um, and, and I think there's at least the same potential for, for uh, full spectrum cannabis, if you like. Um, uh, again, I mean, it depends uh, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, adult use or, or medical use. Um, I, I think the, 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 the distinction between those two things is often unhelpful um, and has been more uh, credited as a, as a result of campaigns to try and achieve reform. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, I mean, you look at different, I mean, France, I believe, is one of the highest consuming uh, cannabis, cannabis uh, highest, highest consumers of cannabis in the EU, although now it probably has the strictest laws about cannabis. Um, uh, it, Italy, uh, I know there's very widespread use there, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's largely decriminalised in practice. Um, and, and the UK, the police are more involved now in effectively decriminalising it than the politicians. Uh, the politicians are simply f scared to face up to the to face up to the subject at all. Um, so there's tremendous potential here. Uh, that you know, as we know, there are many companies. Uh, are battling to get in and, and take hold of this market and, and the, the, the governments and regulators need to catch up. We got even the few, a few cannabis companies to be listed on the land of stock exchange, particularly next exchange yeah. to be quite active and that was quite, was quite interesting because, you know, definitely a, 
a, a big step forward for a, you know for a, for the stock exchange to accept actually a company that is operating or is investing within the cannabis space. So things are happening, but obviously uh, they are taking they're taking their times. Um, it would be nice maybe if you can each of you can. Uh, um, say something about what would you say to the UK government or to, or to the EU um, in order to open up those doors to medicinal cannabis? Frank, do you want to start? What would you say to them? I would say that the evidence is out there. Embrace the evidence. Put in whatever regulations you need to do, whatever steps have to be, be taken, whatever hoops have to be jumped through. If you have an established way that medicine gets on the NHS. But take, but take some of the evidence that's there. I mean, use it in a positive way. Don't try to do research like we've done in the United States for years to prove that cannabis is bad. Let's try to see that maybe if cannabis is good. I mean, that's the only advice I can give you is that based on my experiential knowledge, people benefit from the use of cannabis. And it's, it's sad to say, and, and you know, Peter brought it up already, but when you have a seasoned child, this is essentially a test tube to see whether cannabis oil works. If you have a seizure and you drop the, the cannabis oil into the seizure test tube and the seizures go away, then it worked. <laughs> Embrace the medicine. Look at it as a positive. Don't see this as the beginning of the end of the civilized world. See it as a way maybe to potentially help the civilized world. Peter, what's your uh, take on this? Uh, I think the, the most powerful argument is that it's happening already, is that people are consuming cannabis already. People are using cannabis as medicine already. And, and, and all of it at the moment is, is in the ha hands of criminals. Now, you know, a lot of those criminals, if you like, are low-level criminals. You know, they may be people who are growing a few plants themselves at home. But there are a lot, but there are also a substantial amount of these criminals who are very nasty people and who, whose profits from the cannabis trade are feeding into even worse forms of, or much worse forms of criminality. And, and, and this, this is really the, 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 the missing link that the politicians are, are missing. Uh, that, that, that they need to take it out of the hands of criminals. It's happening already. It's absurd. You know, the Home Office, the way the Home Office treats cannabis, and if you want a license, if you want to talk about licensing, you have to regard cannabis uh, in the same way as you might regard weapons-grade nuclear material. I mean, that really is the way they treat it. And yet you can go 50 yards that way or 50 yards that way, and you can get yourself a £10 bag in five minutes. It, it, it's it's farcical. It's completely ridiculous. I mean, they they did it with the alcohol. They did it with the tobacco. You know why they shouldn't be doing it that with cannabis? That's uh, that's crazy. Um, Lisa, what's your uh, your your words of this? Well, on the medical side, I would say you know drop the precautionary principle. You know there are people uh, suffering. There are, there's ample evidence really that people. Are benefiting, and, and you know what is the worst that can happen by allowing uh, doctors under their own supervision to allow some people in pain from experimenting uh, with cannabis? It doesn't seem like there's a big downside to this. On the recreational side, uh, I would echo um, what Peter has said. Of course, there's a there's a huge uh, uh, aspect of this in, involving getting rid of that black market um, in the UK, where there's a big panic about psychosis, I would say that you can regulate the cannabis and, and reduce those risks. Um, and on simple cynical grounds, if you like, there is a lot of money to be made for the government. Take it away from the criminals, get it into the exchequer. You know, the research I've done suggests that the UK government could be making 700 million pounds a year just from the excise duty on the product. That doesn't include uh, all the indirect taxes around it, the income taxes, the corporate tax, the business rates, the uh, general increase in legitimate economic activity. There is a big prize, I think, to be gained here, it's even from the basic financial, uh, in a basic financial sense, um, there is something to be gained here for the government by making a product that is somewhat safer, certainly much cleaner and more legitimate by, uh, by reducing 
that criminal aspect. And there is very little to fear politically. The, you know, politicians are living in the past. They think that the general public is still very concerned about cannabis. It may well be different with class A drugs, but with cannabis, I think that the, the fears have largely been alleviated and the public is in front of the politicians on this. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, you know, your views on this uh, such hot topic at the moment and hopefully we will see things moving forward quicker than, uh, you know, than uh, we expect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Sure. Bye bye. 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 See you. Really, really good uh, uh, panel with uh, some really interesting points that should be brought to the government actually and, uh, and finally open their eyes to embrace um, legalization of uh, cannabis for their benefits and for the benefits of uh, all the patients and everybody that is suffering of uh, uh, diseases. Uh, this is everything from the Financial Fox. I will see you next time.